Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You know that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this lesson is number two in a new series entitled Oneness in Christ. And this lesson for October 13 of 2018 is entitled Causes of Disunity. Hmm, causes of disunity. I don't know if that's something we want to know about or not. Anyway, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow before you once more, recognize your continual presence, but especially now asking for the guidance of the Holy Spirit as we study these things together. May we understand some of the issues that were involved here and may we uh, not be caught up in those same issues as our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. I don't think I need to tell anyone who might be listening today that uh, the scriptures from beginning to end are full of examples of people and even entire nations turning against God and suffering terrible consequences. Now, it seems so obvious to us. Didn't any of them sort of get the picture? Are I mean, those terrible consequences because God punished them for disobeying? Well, let me just give an example, and then, you, you, and then, and then I'll, maybe you all can help me answer the question. If you look at the times when God specifically sent them to do certain battles, they won. Often they, went, they won without losing a single soldier, it says in the Bible. And then times when they went to war without God's help, they lost terribly. They were destroyed. I mean, how many times does that have to happen before you sort of write, hmm, let me see, was this a good... <laughs> you know, you'd think after a while, someone would figure out, we, we ought to sort of get God in on this plan before we move forward. I ought to remember, though, that the, the, all of these stories we're reading about were not all that different than what played out in the, before the creation of, of Genesis, in Genesis 1. Mm -hmm. So the unlucky universe, the war in heaven, uh, apparently not a whole lot different. Yeah, well, yeah, clearly, yeah. And then what we see in Scripture is they go through this cycle and they realize they hit the bottom and they realize they need God's help. They, they turn back to Him, at least partially, and God starts blessing them again and things get better and better. And, oh, okay, fine, then we can go back to our rebellion and off they go again. We, just time and time and time again in these cycles. Oh, well, 1 Corinthians 4, 9 is... is uh... <laughs> Yeah. It tell, gives us an insight as to how things work. Yeah. Was it impossible for the children of Israel to see the larger picture and to understand what was happening to them? Why was it so difficult for them to follow God's will for them? They had been warned specifically. I mean, you can't overlook all the advice in, in Deuteronomy, for example. Um, those predictions were so specific and so closely matched what would actually happen to Israel later, many years later, that modern skeptics have claimed that the book of Deuteronomy could not possibly have been written by Moses himself. They say it must have been written a thousand years later after all those events had actually happened. You can't, you can't predict, <coughs> God, not even God can predict the future, so you have to a book like Deuteronomy has to be written after those things happen. It's, it's history. It's not, it's not prophecy. Well, the book of Joshua tells of many victories under the leadership of God and Joshua. They just marched into the country of the territory of Palestine. They marched to the north. They just wiped out a whole bunch of powerful nations. They marched to the south. They wiped out powerful nations. Wow. I mean, they repeatedly won battles against, I mean, just look at Look at Jericho, for example. But as soon as we get to the book of Judges, what do we find? Wow. He, already in chapters 2 and 3, we see the beginnings of the yo-yo experience, up and down in their relationship with God. Well, if you look at Judges 2, 11 through 23, which we won't take time to read completely, how was God's anger or wrath involved in all that? Was it God just getting upset by their behavior and causing all those problems that they experienced? Well, we have learned in this class, and we've talked about it before, that God's wrath is simply His turning away and loving disappointment from those who do not want Him anyway, 
thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. So why did they rebel so frequently? Did they, I don't know, I mean, do we dare ask a question like this? Did they think sin was more fun? Well, you could have people who were leadership type, you know, so mm -hmm. instigators who said, well, let's do this. And, and then you have the follower types who would, maybe we wouldn't have gone that way on their own, but hey, let's, let's follow so-and-so. You know, mm -hmm. So they get this peer pressure kind of thing and, and uh, they, yeah. it just snowballs. The interesting thing is, and you know, you, what you say may be the story, but it's interesting that the people who are named in the book of Judges were all leading the children of Israel in the right direction, at least initially. Right. Yeah, I'm not talking about elected leaders. I'm just yeah. talking that usually everybody doesn't have the same idea at the same yeah. time. Sure. And there's somebody who, who is out of sync with God and makes a suggestion and and the others just, you know, like with uh, Aaron, you know, it wasn't his, originally his idea to build this calf, but the people prevailed on him, and then he yeah. built it, and then he tried to rationalize it. I have a terrible feeling that I might be like an Aaron if things are really, you know, it's how do you, I mean, you lead a millions, a couple million people, and they all say, do this, and you say, nope. I mean, I don't know. It, Where's the democracy? Yeah, exactly. Mob rule. Did anybody, there must have been some people who said, well now hold on, we don't follow God and this is what happens. We do follow God and this is what happens. There must have been some people who said, what's going on here? Yeah, like with Elijah, God said that he had preserved so many, you know, he, Elijah wasn't aware of these people, but God had preserved some for him, yeah. himself. Well, Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 9 is an example of um, some directions were given by God. Carrie, you want to share that with us? Yes. If you obey the Lord your God and faithfully keep all his commands that I am giving you today, he will make you greater than any other nation on earth. Obey the Lord your God and all these blessings will be yours. The Lord will bless your towns and your fields. The Lord will bless you with many children, with abundant crops, and with many cattle and sheep. The Lord will bless your corn crops and the food you prepare from them. The Lord will bless everything you do. The Lord will defeat your enemies when they attack you. They will attack from one direction, but they will run from you in all directions. The Lord your God will bless your work and fill your barns with corn. He will bless you in the land that he is giving you. If you obey the Lord your God and do everything he commands, he will make you his own people as he has promised. That's from the Good News Translation put out by the American Bible Society. Now, if you had a promise like that from someone you, who you thought might actually be able to do that for you, how would you even think of going in a different direction? I mean, how could, what more could you ask for? How do we do that? <laughs> now, Gordon, did you have This to is to us also. Yeah, yeah. A thousand years later, we read in, Jeremiah, in the book of Jeremiah what was happening to the children of Israel. Let me just look at those verses very briefly. Jeremiah 3, 14 to 18 unfaithful people come back you belong to me I will take one of you from each town and two from each clan and I will bring you back to Mount Zion I will give you rulers who obey me and they will rule you with wisdom and understanding then when you have become numerous in the land people will no longer talk about my covenant box they will no longer think about it or remember it they will not even need it nor will they make another one when that time comes Jerusalem will be called the throne of the Lord and all nations will gather there to worship me. They will no longer do what, that, what their stubborn and evil hearts tell them. Israel will, jo will join with Judah and together um, they will come from exile in the land 
I'm sorry, in the country in the north and will return to the land that I gave your ancestors as a permanent possession. Wow. When did that happen? Yeah, when did that happen? Hasn't happened yet. I mean, when, when those words are written, the, king, the northern kingdom of Israel had already for more than 100, probably 100, about 100 years, had disappeared into captivity under Assyria. And as they, we never hear from them again as a nation. They were gone. Well, God was still crying out, appealing to them to come back. He was promising that the city of Jerusalem would be once again be the throne of the Lord. Will there ever be a time in the future when that might be true? Well, it'll be true after the third coming, right? New Jerusalem. The amazing thing is that God is still loving, merciful, and generous toward his people, even though they have, I mean, now they had been through a thousand years of rebellion, division, they were bent on idolatry. Well, I, I like to think about the devil side of things once in a while, because it helps us to sort of understand the opposition. What do you think the devil was saying to his fellow rebellious angels as God was making those appeals through Jeremiah? Did the devil think he was about to win the great controversy on this earth? Was he laughing at God? What do you think? I don't think it would have gone unnoticed. Why was it that God could not help the people unless they were obedient to him? Well, they want to listen. My understanding of the word obedient comes, uh, means a willingness to listen. Yeah. And if you don't want to listen, what's God going to do to you? Mm -hmm. As I go through the Old Testament, it says you don't listen. You don't listen. You don't listen. Mm -hmm. I mean, what can you do? What is a parent going to do or a teacher going to do if the kids don't want to listen? Do we dare to ask about the Adventist church? Have there been times of apparent rebellion against God and suffered? And we have suffered serious consequences? Not in our church, has it? <laughs> well, well, righteousness by faith in 1888, that era, there, there was a sharp division. There was a sharp division. That, that is absolutely true. Yeah. 1918 Bible Conference? Yeah. 1919, I think it was. What do you make of this verse? It's, this verse is repeated verbatim in two places in the book of Judges, near the end. There was no king in Israel at that time. All the people did just as they pleased. What kind of a nation would that lead to? Chaos. What we have. Well, if you read on in the book of Judges and you come to Judges 19 to 21 and you read the story of the Levite and his concubine and you're one of the angels of God and you're saying, what if you were the guardian angel of the concubine? What would you say? Well, Look, look, look at what we might be able to learn from the book of Judges, especially Judges 2 and 3, back in the beginning, about God's wrath. Um, Dennis, I think that's yours. The Lord had, through Moses, set before his people the result of unfaithfulness. By refusing to keep his covenant, they would cut themselves off from the life of God, and his blessing could not come upon them. At times, these warnings were heeded, and rich blessings were bestowed upon the Jewish nation, and through them upon surrounding peoples, but more often in the, their history they forgot God and lost sight of the high privilege as his representatives. They robbed him of the service he required of them and they robbed their fellow men of religious guidance and a holy example. They desired to appropriate to themselves the fruit of the vineyard over which they had been made stewards. Their covetousness and greed caused them to despise even be to be despised even by the heathen. 
Thus the Gentile world was given occasion to misinterpret their <coughs> the character of God and the laws of his kingdom. Uh, prophets and kings, um, 20, 20 and 20.1 20. 20. 20. 20. to 20.0. 21.0. 21.0. Well, what about that? How do our actions in the community impact those around us? What does the community around us think of us as a church? Do they even know that we exist? Not often. Another, another terrible example of rebellion and its consequences is found in the story of Rehoboam. Um, maybe we should just go ahead and read that. 1 Kings 12, 1 to 16. Rehoboam went to Shechem. Now this, remember the story here. There was David, King ruled for about 40 years. Solomon ruled for about 40 years. And now Solomon is dead, and his son Rehoboam has taken his place. So now, in his very early days of his, of his kingship, Rehoboam went to Shechem, where all the people of northern Israel had gathered to make him king. When, Rehoboam, when Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who had gone to Egypt to escape from King Solomon, heard this news, he returned from Egypt. The people of the northern tribe sent for him, and then they all went together to Rehoboam and said to him, your father Solomon treated us harshly and placed heavy burdens on us. If you make these burdens lighter and make life easier for us, we will be your loyal subjects. Come back in three days and I will give you my answer, he replied, so they left. King Rehoboam consulted the older men who had lived as his father Solomon's advisors. What answer do you advise me to give these people, he asked. They replied, if you want to serve this people well, give a favorable answer to their request, and they will always serve you loyally. But he ignored the advice of the older men and went instead to the young men who had grown up with him and who were now his advisors. What do you advise me to do, they, he asked. What shall I say to the people who, have asked, who are asking me to make their burdens lighter? They replied, this is what you should tell them. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Tell them my father placed heavy burdens on you and I'll make them even heavier. He beat you with a whip, I'll flog you with a horse whip. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to King Rehoboam as he had instructed them. The king ignored the advice of the older men and spoke harshly to the people. And as the younger men had advised, he said, my father placed heavy burdens on you and I will make them even heavier. He beat you with a whip, I'll flog you with a horse whip. It was the will of the Lord to bring about what he had spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, to the prophet Ahijah from Shiloh. This is why the king did not pay any attention to them. When the people saw that the king would not listen to them, they shouted, Down with David and his family. What have they ever done for us? People of Israel, let's go home. Let Rehoboam look out for himself. So the people of Israel rebelled, leaving Rehoboam as king only of the people who lived in the territory of Judah. That was the beginning of the end for the for the people of the northern tribes. Well, in the early days of the reign of Solomon, as he was building that magnificent temple for God in Jerusalem and following God's will for his life, the nation of Israel was at a high point. But in that process, Solomon invited um, into Jerusalem many foreign workers who demanded high wages for their services. Of course, the children of Israel who were working for him also wanted equally high wages. Soon the spiraling wages required a massive increase in taxes. Sound at all familiar to anybody? Hmm. Never heard that story before. <laughs> Never heard that story before. <laughs> About the same time, in the process of cementing agreements with foreign nations, Solomon began to add to the number of wives and concubines that he was supporting. Later he began to build pagan temples for them on the Mount of Olives. Finally, later in his life, he realized his heiress after, I might add, after offering his children as sacrifices to the god Molech. He tried to correct his errors, but it was too late. So when Rehoboam became the next king, he did some very foolish things. And uh, Gordon, I think you have some words about that. From Prophets and Kings, page 90. Had Rehoboam and his inexperienced counselors understood the divine will concerning Israel, they would have listened to the request of the people for decided reforms in the administration of the government. 
But in the hour of opportunity that came to them during the meeting in Shechem, they failed to reason from cause to effect and thus forever weakened their influence over a large number of the people. Their expressed determination to perpetuate and add to the oppression introduced during Solomon's reign was in direct conflict with God's plan for Israel and gave the people ample occasion to doubt the sincerity of their motives. In this unwise and unfeeling attempt to exercise power, the king and his chosen counselors revealed the pride of position and authority. Wow. Well, what do we know about the background of Rehoboam? <coughs> Not much. We have no, men, no idea how many children Solomon had. Now, how many wives did Solomon have? Hundreds, wasn't it? Three hundred, was it three hundred? Seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines. concubines. How many of them had children? Most, probably. Many of them, I'm sure. <coughs> we do not know whether Rehoboam was his firstborn son or even why Rehoboam had became the next king. But with all his military act activities, Jerusalem bu building and hundreds of wives, Solomon probably had very little time to educate his children. But in his early days, he wrote some important advice for them. I'm going to turn us to Proverbs 4, 1 to 9. Listen to what your father teaches you, my sons. Pay attention and you will have understanding. Why I'm, what, I'm, what I'm teaching you is good, so remember it all. When I was only a little boy, my parents' only son, my father would teach me. He would say, remember what I say and never forget it. Do as I tell you and you will live. Get wisdom and insight. Do not forget or ignore what I say. Do not abandon wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will keep you safe. Getting wisdom is the most important thing you can do. Whatever else you get, get insight. Love wisdom and she will make you great. Embrace her and she will bring you honor. She will be your crowning glory. So do you think uh, Rehoboam took that seriously? Well, look at Proverbs 9 to go along with that. Chapter 9, verse 10. To be wise, you must first have reverence for the Lord. If you know the Holy One, you will have understanding. Did Rehoboam recognize that? No, nope. I doubt it. Yeah. Well, we know what happened. He, the, 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 the northern kingdoms were divided from the southern kingdom, and now we have a northern kingdom called Israel and a southern kingdom called Judah. Even though important prophets like Elijah and Elisha and finally Hosea worked in the northern kingdom, the history of the northern kingdom was one continuous decline from that day until they were taken into captivity. There is not one of their kings that was really an uphill, uh, that came, brought them closer to God. They were downhill, down, down, down. And of course, some of those famous kings were Ahab, for example. Well, fortunately, in the New Testament, everything went just well, just perfectly, right? <laughs> no, unfortunately, the same kind of trends continued into the New Testament. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 17. By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, I appeal to all of you, my brothers and sisters, to agree in what you say, so that there will be no divisions among you. Be completely unified with only one thought and one purpose. For some people from Chloe's family have told me quite plainly, my friends, that there are quarrels among you. Let me put it this way. Each one of you says something different. One says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Peter. And another, I follow Christ. Christ has been divided into groups. Was it Paul who died on the cross for you? Were you baptized as Paul's disciples? And so forth. Wow. Paul had spent a year and a half in Corinth establishing the church there. He had a deep love for the believers there. But after leaving them and while working in Ephesus, rumors began to come to him that there were problems in the church at Corinth. The book which we identify as 1 Corinthians that I just read from is not the first letter Paul had written to his friends at Corinth. Proof of that, look at 1 Corinthians 5 verse 9. In the letter that I wrote you, 
I told you not to associate with immoral people. So, was there a previous letter? Mm -hmm. Sounds like it, doesn't it? Clearly, sexual immorality, we know the story of Corinth. It was, I mean, it was a port city. It was a city, a city full of itinerant sailors. Uh, sexual immorality was a huge problem. There was a, a temple up on the plain above Corinth that was uh, basically a, a temple full, uh, full of temple virgins. And they would come down every afternoon to ply their trade, and it was something else. Um, look at 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 to 7, verse 1. Some people think this might have been a part of that first letter of Paul. Do not try to work together as equals with unbelievers, for it cannot be done. How can right and wrong be partners? How can light and darkness live together? How can Christ and the devil agree? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? How can God's temple come to terms with pagan idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God himself has said, I will make my home with my people and live among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And so the Lord says, you must leave them and separate yourselves from them. Have nothing to do with what, what is unclean and I will accept you. I will be your father and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. All these promises are made to us, my dear friends. So then let us purify ourselves from everything that makes body and soul unclean and let us be completely holy by living in awe of God. Does that sound like something that he might have initially written? Well, possibly. Then he wrote that magnificent letter we call 1 Corinthians. It was in response to requests that they had made to him and reports that he received from Chloe's family. But word came that the letter had not had its desired effect. Paul apparently made a brief trip to Corinth, probably traveling by boat directly across from Ephesus to Corinth, and he was rebuffed and treated very rudely by the Corinthian believers. He returned to Ephesus with a very sad mind, wondering what he should do next. And what did he do? He wrote a strong letter. He wrote a very strong letter to them, which may have been what we now have as 2 Corinthians 10 to, 14, 10 to 13. And he let them have it. <laughs> he really let them have it. It was carried by hand by Titus. And how do you think Paul felt as he watched Titus leave with that letter in hand? And he waited. And he waited. And he waited. And what did he finally decide to do? He said, I can't wait anymore. So he started walking around from Ephesus all the way around through Macedonia toward Corinth. And what happened? They met. He met who? He met Titus. He met Titus. And Titus, the Greek says, Titus evangelized me. What does evangelized mean? Told the news. He brought me the good news. Evangelized means bringing good news. Well, Paul has spent a lot of time in Corinth and he spent a lot of time in Ephesus. On his final journey as a completely free man, he made a brief stop. Now he's, he's and we just, if we review the story again real briefly, he finally got down to Corinth. Winter was coming and so he sat down there and it was from Corinth that he wrote the books of Romans and Galatians. He knew about the problems that had, he had just come through Galatia. He apparently knew about the problems that were developing there, so he wrote a letter to them. He wrote a letter to the Romans where he was planning to go next. And um, he, he spoke some very, very straight words. Um, so, but then he started, he, was, he, wanted to be, he wanted to get to Jerusalem in time for Passover. And what happened, do you remember? We just studied the book of Acts. He didn't make it there because someone, someone planned to kill him. He found out that there were people on the boat, that, as, as he was ready to get on the boat, he found out that there were several Jewish people on the boat that were determined to kill him on the boat. So he gave up that idea and turned around and walked all the way around. And as he came past Ephesus that he had just left a few months before, he met with the elders. And what did he say to them? Do you remember? Look at Acts 20, Acts 20, 25 to 31. I have gone about among all of you, preaching the kingdom of God, and now I know that 
none of you will ever see me again. I don't know whether God had, had God revealed that to him in a vision? We don't know. So I solemnly declare to you this very day, if any of you should be lost, I am not responsible. For I have not held back from announcing to you the whole purpose of God. So keep watch over yourselves and over all the flock which the Holy Spirit has placed in your care. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he made his own through the blood of his Son. I know that after I leave, fierce wolves will come among you, and they will not spare the flock. The time will come when some men from your own group will tell lies to lead the believers away from them. Watch then, and remember that with many tears, day and night, I taught every one of you for three years. Fierce wolves. What could fierce wolves mean un, under those in that context? People who did not have the best interest of the believers. People who were trying to corrupt them, lead them away from what Paul had said. What do wolves do with sheep? Kill them. Kill them. them up. Well, sheep usually, when they when they see something frightening happening, they they clump together with their their heads together and their their, their wool-covered backsides facing outwards. And the wolves, in order to really get them and to kill them, have to scatter them. They have to at least get some of them away from the group. And so Paul says, what happens? He says, people will come from among you. Uh, could that ever happen in our day? We don't have any wolves among us, right? Well, I think we've had will it be a one. preacher? Will it be a television evangelist? Well, will it be someone it. here? Well, well, Satan has always been most effective when he can get those who claim to be faithful followers of God to do his will. Rebels and false leaders within the Christian church have been, have been and are devastating. Even Jesus warned us repeatedly in Matthew 24. What did he say? False prophets and false Christs are going to be active and to deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. Mark 13, 22, and also in, also in Matthew 24, I think it's verse 23. Well, look at what Paul said to the Ephesians. Now, when was the book of Ephesians written? Don't remember? Paul is, is, is near the end of his first imprisonment in Rome. He's living in a uh, sort of um, imposed exile there I mean, with, what do we call that, house arrest, I guess. He, and and he, 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 he sort of is reading tea leaves, if I can use an expression, and he, he gets the idea that it's, he, pretty soon he may, be, he may be released. And so he writes Ephesians, um, Colossians, people, some people believe he wrote Hebrews at that time, and Philemon. All those books were written about that same time. So what did he say at that point in time? Look at Ephesians 5, 6 to 14. Do not let anyone deceive you with foolish words. It is because of these very things that God's anger will come upon those who do not obey him. So have nothing at all to do with such people. You yourselves used to be in the darkness, but since you have become the Lord's people, you are in the light. So you must live like people who belong to the light, for it is the light that brings a rich harvest of every kind of goodness, righteousness, and truth. Try to, do, uh, try to learn what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the worthless things that people do, things that belong to the darkness. Instead, bring them out to the light. It is really too shameful even to talk about the things they do in secret. And when all things are brought out to the light, then their true nature is clearly revealed. For anything that is clearly revealed becomes light. That is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, and rise from death, and Christ will shine on you. So it sounds like Paul was pretty much aware of what was going on, huh? What does it mean by God's anger will come upon those who do not obey him? Is this Paul? Ultimately, Paul? let you go. Mm -hmm. Do your own thing. Apparently, Paul understood mm -hmm. judges pretty well, huh? Mm -hmm. it, it, Paul lived, was a very 
insightful person. Fortunately, his, he had a good background, and now he got a chance with, with his experience with the Lord uh, to change his. Didn't have to throw the old stories out. He just modeled them into something that was very rational. He reinterpreted them. Yep. Well, <clears throat> as far as we know, Paul never had any children of his own. He took on Timothy as his spiritual son and worked very closely with him for a long time. And so it turns out that his very last book he wrote, Second Timothy, was addressed specifically to Timothy. And what did he say? He talked to him about the problems that would arise in the church. He encouraged Timothy to speak the truth while spreading the message about God. Myra, I think you have some words about that. Second Timothy 3, 12 to 17. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And evil persons and impostors will keep on going from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived themselves. But as for you, continue in the truth that you were taught and firmly believe. You will know, you know who your teachers were and you remember that ever since you were a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through the faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting faults, and giving instruction for right living, so that the person who serves God may fully, may be fully gratified qualified and equipped to do every kind of good deed. Those are very famous words, those last ones, but I want to go back up to the first words you wrote, you read there. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted? Is that true in 2018? Yes. Yep. Jesus China. said the same thing, if they hate me, you'll, they'll hate you. China, they called enemies of the state right now as we live. About 40 years ago, there was a, a pastor evangelist by the name of Emilio Connectly. Mm -hmm. And I, a story that uh, I remember him telling, if you're not having troubles, the Lord, you, you've moved yourself away from the Lord. Mm -hmm. you, you just, uh, you will be persecuted if, if Satan is going after you or whatever it is, you can, you're going to face some tough times. So if I'm not persecuted, does that mean I'm not living a godly life? Well, that would be the question, wouldn't it? If we really believe these words of Paul, and the depends flip on what we mean by persecution, right. too. Yeah. 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 And the flip so, side is, if you're well off financially and your health is good, it must be that God's smiling on you. That's what we got with the book of Job. And uh, to this day, uh, that we quote passages from, uh, from the four friends of Job, and uh, God at the end says, you guys are not telling the truth. Mm -hmm. We have to learn about evil so we can appreciate the, 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 the length that the infinite, the creator God will go to, to educate us. Why is it so easy for people, even in our day, to be led astray by speculations and by misinterpretations of scripture? Jim, you mentioned, I think, in our, our last week, that there's thousands of different churches, thousands of them. Uh, what, I mean, you would think if we all believe in the Bible and we take the Bible seriously, shouldn't we all be agreeing and all be in the same church? There's a, a quotation from the book, Lift Him Up by Ellen White. And the gist of it is, in the end, there's going to be a group of people that will all, even though they come from different backgrounds, they will still have the same message. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't think we've gotten there yet. Yeah. Wow. Why is it that so few people, even in our own church, understand the overarching story of the great controversy and how it impacts so much of what we read in the Bible? Well, I think one thing is uh, that Ellen White has been discredited mm -hmm. through liberal theology and, oh, and various attacks. Um, and therefore, a lot of people just don't read her. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's almost like if she had said she 
uh, was infallible, they would condemn her for that. But if they find anything wrong, then they condemn her because she w is not er, infallible. It's very interesting. Some years ago, there was a book written by a former Adventist pastor criticizing Ellen White very severely. And um, I know one time that someone came to him and said, well, look, all these problems that you're finding in Ellen White, they're also in the Bible. Look, this, this, this. And he turned, his face turned just beet red. And he says, don't you try to destroy, the, don't you try to destroy the Bible in order to protect Ellen White. I mean, you know, anyway. So many people forget the role the devil plays constantly in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Those who are called to be ministers to God's people must be very, very careful to follow God's word and not deviate into any of these speculative ideas. And I don't have to tell anyone in this group, I'm sure, and I'm sure you out there, that there are people around trying to promote every kind of crazy idea that you can imagine. Well, there are, there are many reasons why divisions arise in the church. Jim, I think you know, have something about that. The Lord desires His chosen servants to learn how to unite in harmonious effort. It may seem to some that the contrast between their gifts and the gifts of a fellow laborer is too great to allow them to unite in harmonious effort. But when they remember that there are varied minds to be reached and that some will reject the truth as it is presented by one laborer only to open their hearts to God's truth as it is presented in a different manner by another laborer. They will hopefully endeavor to labor together in unity. Their talents, however diverse, may all be under the control of the same spirit. In every word and act, kindness and love will be revealed, and as each worker fills his appointed place faithfully, the prayer of Christ for the unity of his followers will be answered, and the world will come that these are Excuse me, the world will come to know that these are his disciples. That's, that's straight out of uh, the Bible, isn't it? Yeah, I, I found that quotation. I'll just read a paragraph here from uh, Lift Him Up, page uh, 309. The principle here laid down is the natural outgrowth of the Christian religion. Especially will those who are engaging, excuse me, engaged in proclaiming the last solemn message to a dying world seek to fulfill this scripture. Although possessing different temperaments and dispositions, they will see eye to eye in all matters of a religious belief. They will speak the same things. They will have the same judgment. They will be one in Christ Jesus. Lift him up, page three. Wow. Well, Jesus said that basically, didn't he, in John 13? And that is a state of at one moment. One moment, exactly. And that's what God, the infinite, my understanding, the infinite has been doing since he began to create eons ago. And it was not an event, it's the way God communicates to his creatures. Here's, my, here's the words of Jesus, which go along with that. And now I give you, a new, this is the last night he's with his disciples. And now I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you so that you must, uh, so you must love one another. If you have love one for another, then everyone will know that you're my disciples. Is what does that mean? From? I'm reading from John 13, 34 and 35 from the Good News Bible. What does that imply about everybody else? Nobody else Obviously, is loving. Obviously, it's different than everybody else. <laughs> if everybody was loving and would always live, live that way, you really wouldn't, you couldn't sin. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, they, if you think about it, uh, it, 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 the logic is you wouldn't, couldn't or wouldn't sin if you always do the loving thing. If you're not self-centered, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there many people in our day who are following the example of Judges 17, 6, doing what, was right, what is right in their own eyes? I think a lot of people don't really care. I think as, as we look around. Uh, OK, 
Can, could church leaders and Sabbath school teachers faithfully shepherd God's people to prevent the kinds of problems that we read about in this lesson? They can be a positive influence for good, just as Enoch was, but unless the people rise up, there's a statement she talks about how uh, when Nehemiah led mm -hmm. the group in the rebuilding and, and it succeeded because everyone rose to that same level of commitment and, and moved on. So as long as people are just kind of sheep, um, they may follow that, that person. Uh, and maybe that's why God Enoch took Enoch away to give these people a chance to try to grow up, so to speak, mm -hmm. in their relationship with God. Here's some interesting words from David since we talked about Rehoboam a little while before. Proverbs 6 now, we went past, we looked at Proverbs 4. There are seven things that the Lord hates and cannot tolerate. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that kill innocent people, a mind that thinks up wicked plans, feet that hurry off to do evil, a witness who tells one lie after another, and someone who stirs up trouble among friends. In contrast to Paul's chapter on it, chapter yeah. First Corinthians 13. Yeah. You can just practically line up some of the verses. Yeah. Isn't it obvious why God opposes and hates those kinds of behaviors? What would happen if every church member made it his or her responsibility to study the Bible, investigate in order to follow carefully and obediently God's will for their lives? How long would it take before we'd be in the kingdom? Why is it so easy to be led astray by our personal wants and inclinations? Did Rehoboam accept what the young, his young buddies said to him because he wanted to? Probably, huh? Isn't that why we usually accept advice? Well... Each of us has turned to his own way. Have you ever been so attached to some idea that you have come to believe it as God's will for your life? How does that work? Do we rationalize? Well from, what? It didn't work very well for Paul. Yeah. God had to come down and blind him for a few days. Yeah. Well, we're inclined to go our own way, or, you know, depends on who we're, we're listening to. We have our conscience has been corrupted, so we listen to the voice of Satan, um, looking at the time that they to bring up. Quote about looking at that for his will. Okay, well, if you've got it, look at it. Is there, well, let me just bring up this question while you're looking for that. Is there any easy way to know whether we are following our own will or whether we're following God's will? Well, this is uh, fifth volume of the Testimonies 512 and on to par paragraphs one and two. There are three ways in which the Lord reveals his will to us to guide us and to fit us to guide others. How may we know his voice from that of a stranger? How shall we distinguish it from the voice of a false shepherd? God reveals his will to us in his word, the Holy Scriptures. His voice is also revealed in his providential workings. And it will be recognized if we do not separate our souls from him by walking in our own ways, doing according to our own wills, and following the promptings of an unsanctified heart until the senses have become so confused that eternal things are not discerned and the voice of Satan is so disguised that it is accepted as the voice of God. Another way in which God's voice is heard is through the appeals of his Holy Spirit, making impressions on the heart which will be wrought out in the character. If you are in doubt upon any subject, you must first consult the scriptures. If you have truly begun the life of faith, you have given yourself to the Lord to be wholly his and he has given he has taken you to mold and fashion according to his purpose, that you may be a vessel unto honor. You should have an earnest desire to be pliable in his hands and to follow, with, follow whithersoever he may lead you. You are then trusting him to work out 
his design, designs while at the same time you are co cooperating with him by working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Wow. You, my brother, will find difficulty here because you have not yet learned to experience to know, by experience, to know the voice of the Good Shepherd, and this places you in doubt and peril. You ought to be able to distinguish his voice. Well, let's take an example. Joshua man managed to somehow or other almost single-handedly uh, keep the children of Israel more or less on the right course until he died. And near the end of his life, Joshua 24, 31, we have these words, as long as Joshua lived, the people of Israel lived, serve the Lord. And after his death, they continued to do so as long as those leaders were alive who had seen for themselves everything that the Lord had done for Israel. And then what happened? Well, we know what happened. Why did the people of, like Joshua and his fellow leaders have such an impact on the children of Israel? Why weren't there others standing there ready to take up the work of Joshua faithfully following God's will and leading the children of Israel? Was it Joshua's fault for not planning for his successor? Was it God's fault for not keeping the line of leadership? Well, it seemed like the, it died out when the people, the leaders were the ones who had not been there when it happened. What does it mean to say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? Proverbs 9.10 and it's other places too. Proverbs 1.7 and Job 28.28 I think. Source of wisdom. So uh, without, um, well it says fear but reverence or reverence. appreciation Respect. for God. We, we have no uh, direct channel. We, You're going to read another verse, right? We know that, well, we know that uh, uh, the word fear, as trans the word translated fear from Hebrew and Greek, can also mean reverence and respect. And so that's clearly what's intended here. To be in awe of God mm -hmm. is the beginning. Mm -hmm. Recognize his. Paul had to deal with a lot of conflicts in Corinth. One of the most challenging was the subject of whether or not Christians should be allowed to eat food offered to idols. We don't have to, time to go through this all now, but if you, you want to really challenge yourself, look at Acts 15, Romans 14, and 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 and see what you come up with. It seems like Paul is speaking directly in contradiction to what he and the church leaders back in Jerusalem had agreed upon. See if you think that's true. Well, few of us would deny that God's wisdom is best. If you just asked, people, Christians, do you think God's wisdom is? We would probably all say yes. But how does that impact our lives on a day-by-day -day basis? Here are some critical questions from our Bible study guide. Think about these. Why do human beings find that doing what they want is so appealing? How can seeking God's will become more appealing? Isn't that the crux of our lesson, sort of? Self-preservation on the first question. And, and the <laughs> lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the also pride of pride life. Of life. Drawn away by our own lust, as James said. Where, where, where did those ideas come from? Are they, I mean, we, we just... And where death. does that come from? From the devil. Are we so in tune with the devil just naturally that those things are all there? Yep. Most of us, anyway. Why do we frequently lose sight of what God has done for us soon after a crisis has passed? I mean, I, I, I just, it, I'm just flabbergasted. You look at something like what happened at 9-11 here in the United States, or some other major crisis. There's a flood or something like this. We all need to pray. We need to pray that God will, you know, da-da-da-da. Why is it that all of a sudden when all the crisis is gone and so forth, well, we really believe in evolution, we don't believe that God really exists, and so how, how, how do they, how does their mind wrap the, around their, that kind of a thing? It's kind of like the, at the time of Joshua, those who saw the leading of God directly, as long as they were around, mm -hmm. Israel followed, the children of Israel followed God. When they didn't, when those people were gone and they had to rely on word of mouth, the people rebelled. Does obedience to God always lead to unity? 
Or if you come along and you say, I want to really obey God, are you going to find a lot of people who are going to oppose you? Your cultural issues come in. We, we have different, we come from different perceptions. Yeah. So Cultures. It takes a while to, uh, loving interaction to really be able to, like a stream that makes rocks round, you know, pebbles round after a while if they're tumbled together. Yeah. If I'm obedient to God, it will lead to unity with other people who want to be obedient to God. Mm -hmm. but not with people who are casual Not too sure Christians. about that. Mm -hmm. yeah, Paul in Ephesians 4, um, walk in a manner worthy of, of your calling, and he lists a number of things, and then in verse 3 he says, Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So unity yeah. isn't something we create. It's, it's already there in the Spirit. It's when we don't follow the spirit. That so, and okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, if we're not following the spirit, then we're not mm -hmm. going to find. It. How do we find other people in our community that are following the spirit, and should we sort of link arms with them? <coughs> Is it possible to to do that? Well, it all depends on what you mean by linking linking arms. Well, I mean, wouldn't we be more effective? I mean, Jesus picked out 12. He spent that time with them. He said, okay, you know, after three and a half years, I'm gone. It's up to you. Um, he didn't just sort of leave them scattered. What? Small groups would be one way. Okay. How can we continue to focus our attention on Christ in our busy world? I mean, it seems like as time goes by, we get busier and busier and busier with trying to just, you know, keep up with the world. Um, Start first thing in the morning and, and keep him always before you. Let every breath be a prayer. Are we doing anything? And I'll throw this question to you out there. Are you doing anything individually or maybe as a Sabbath school class or as a church to try to promote unity in the church? Can we specifically do, are there some things we can do actually for that goal? Kind and loving Father, we know that the devil is doing everything he possibly can to sow strife, to sow division, disunity among the church. Help us to see his efforts, catch him in his activities and rebuff him if it's possible. Help us not to be led astray by those others who might want to pull this way or that way to tear us apart. We want to be more like you, and we ask that in that process we may find others who sincerely want to follow your will as well, and so that we may pull together to accomplish the work that needs to be done is our prayer in Jesus' name.